did you all see the lunar eclipse last month? Oh, it was absolutely gorgeous here. Like we kind of missed maximum because by the time it had risen above the houses where we are, like it was past maximum, but it was still gorgeous, like still kind of orange hued. And then that sort of shadow of the earth that makes the shape of the moon that you never ever actually see, you know, during the phases of the moon. So it was such an amazing sight. But less about last month, let's talk about what's coming up in the sky for you to see in the rest of July and through August. Now on the 31st of July, we've got something called a black supermoon coming up. Now you might have heard of a blue moon before, which is when you have two full moons in the same calendar month. So there's like 28 or so days between full moons, but then a calendar month lasts 30 days. So occasionally you will get full moons that happen in the same month. A black moon, however, is the same thing, except it's two new moons in a month. So on the 31st, it's going to be the second new moon of July, but it also is going to be a super moon. It's going to be the point in the moon's orbit that it's closest to Earth. It's what we call the perigee in astronomy because the moon's orbit isn't perfectly circular. It's actually kind of elliptical or ovular. So technically, if you're in the Western Hemisphere, i.e. west of Greenwich Mean Time, so I'm talking about the Atlantic Ocean and the Americas, then the new moon falls on the 1st of August, so technically it doesn't count as a black moon, but it's still gonna be this new moon supermoon. And that is not something we can actually see. You know, you can't really see a new moon in the sky because it's there during the day. It's incredibly, incredibly faint. Sometimes you can spot it at like sunrise and sunset. But really where people are gonna see the difference is with the tides. And I think this is great because July and August, I mean, everyone's gonna be on holiday or vacation, right? And most people will probably head to the seaside. And if you're at the seaside, then you're really gonna notice the tides. And in particular, around the end of July, look for the difference between the high tide and the low tide. Usually you will see some difference, but when you've got a new moon supermoon, then the difference is much more pronounced. And that's because you've not only got the moon pulling on the tides, but you've got the moon and the sun lined up and it's the moons at its closest position to Earth to pull on the tides even more. So you get this huge difference between low tide and high tide. So keep an eye out for that. I mean, that is something that I would love to do on my holiday. It's just, you know, lays on the beach and just like watch the tides and be like, hey, look guys, this is what this means. Nobody else cares. Everyone else wants to just go like order a pina colada, but I care, I care. <laughs> Moving on from my weirdness on holidays, every seasoned stargazer knows that July and August is all about the Perseids meteor shower. This is the best meteor shower of the year. You can get up to 60 meteors an hour, so like one a minute. They're incredibly bright. They can be very, very colorful as well. And again, most of us are on holiday or vacation, whatever you wanna call it. And so we're generally places that are a little bit darker, either by the sea or in the mountains or wherever we might be. And so you have a better chance of seeing them. Also, you tend to be up later on holiday as well. Maybe you're coming back from the bar late or something. You don't have to get up early in the morning to go to work. So the fact that we can stay up later to see these is a really good thing. So the peak of the Perseids meteor shower is the 12th and 13th of August this year. And the problem is that there's gonna be a full moon around that time. So that might make spotting them a little bit difficult because the moon's gonna be very bright in the sky and so it's gonna wash out a lot of the fainter ones. So technically the best time to see it would be very early morning when the moon has started to set after its full moon phase. The best way of spotting them, I find, is to lie down. And again, if you're on holiday, you're gonna have like a deck chair or a pool chair, a pool lounger, whatever you wanna call it. Lie down and make sure that your head is pointing to what we call the radiant. So the radiant in this case is gonna be the constellation of Perseus. Now the easiest way to find that is to look for the W, Cassiopeia. Find the W and then just head slightly down from there and you should find Perseus. When you've done that, turn your head so that the back of it points towards Perseids because all the meteors are gonna look like they're coming from that constellation. So they're basically gonna be radiant outwards from there. And so you should be able to see any of them that come by. If you're in the Southern hemisphere, Perseus doesn't really rise that high for you. So really you gotta keep an eye on the horizon. You're gonna have to get somewhere really, really dark to be able to spot them, but you should still be able to. 
Meteor shower images are hands down my favorite astrophotography images. You know, you have the big exposures of the Milky Way, you tend to have like trees and people in the foreground. They just always look so spectacular streaking across the skies. So if you do take any this summer, you know, tweet them to me, tag me on Instagram, you know, like send me your Flickr photo album, whatever. I'd love, love to see them. But enough about the sky because there is a lot going on in terms of astronomy research and news this month. So without further ado, let's get into this. So a couple of space exploration related news. I'm filming this on Sunday, the 21st of July. So we literally just had the Apollo 50th anniversary uh, date yesterday, which was amazing to see all the documentaries and all the reactions online to it. If you still haven't caught my video on how we know the moon has formed, thanks to the experiments done by Apollo, check that one out. Speaking of the moon, the Indian probe Chandrayaan-2 that's gonna land on the south pole of the moon is scheduled to launch uh, tomorrow for me, Monday, so hopefully that went through okay. It was supposed to launch uh, last Monday the 14th, but it had a technical snag on the launch pad, so that had to be delayed, which was such a shame. It's supposed to be following up from the previous mission, Chandrayaan-1, which found water on the surface of the moon. So I think a lot of people have got high hopes for this one and are really looking forward to what it finds when it gets there in around September. Other space exploration news, if you remember a couple of months ago, the SpaceX crew Dragoncraft had an explosion on a test launch pad and they finally figured out the cause of that explosion now. They found that it was due to a leaky valve which leaked oxidizer onto some titanium and then that essentially exploded. Uh, the Crew Dragon is supposed to be taking astronauts to the International Space Station. It's one of the crafts that NASA's uh, commissioned to replace uh, using the Russian Soyuz module, which is, you know, getting on 40, 50 years old now, taking people still to the ISS, along with Boeing's Starliner as well. So Boeing's craft still looks like it's on course to possibly getting astronauts to the ISS by the end of 2019, but this explosion is gonna be a massive step backwards for SpaceX. It's probably gonna push back that timescale on when they can get astronauts onto the ISS in this craft for the first time. But it does mean that it's gonna be safer for them because they've discovered this problem ahead of time. One thing I'm really excited about this month is that NASA has given the green light to a project to one of Saturn's moons called Titan. And essentially it's a carbon copy of the Curiosity rover that's on Mars, but instead of giving it wheels, they've given it wings. They've given it like a, sort of a helicopter drone, like rotor blades, and they're calling it Dragonfly. And essentially that this probe is gonna do is fly around the surface of Titan and like hop and drone fly around it to explore and take samples of the atmosphere and the soil and the rocks there. And they can do that because Titan has this really thick atmosphere and really low gravity. So it takes a lot less energy to get something airborne. They've even said that if humans had wings, then you could fly on Titan, which blows my mind. I've just been having dreams of me flying around the surface of Titan for the past like week. And the reason we want to explore Titan is because it's one of these worlds that we think will be ideal for life and that life could have evolved on. If, if you remember the Huygens probe, which was part of the Cassini mission, actually descended through the atmosphere of Titan for about two and a half hours or so before we lost contact with it. What, like 15, 10, 15 years ago or so now? And it showed, you know, through this very thick atmosphere, a surface that really looked very similar to Earth. It had mountains and flat lake beds and also like what looked like channels of where liquid had once flowed as well. And the cool thing about this mission is that it's innovation, but it's not invention. You know, they're not reinventing the wheel to go to Titan at all. They're literally just taking what we already used on Mars and what we know works and just adapting it slightly. So that should get launched in 2026 and it's supposed to arrive at about 2034, which is a way away, I guess. So if this channel is maybe still going in 15 years, I'll update you. So sticking with space exploration for one more thing before we head on to the really cool astronomy results that have been coming out this month. Hayabusa 2 has managed to get the very first sample of the interior of an asteroid. So this is the JAXA, the Japanese mission to the asteroid Ryugu. And if you remember a couple of months ago, it fired like a bullet into the surface of this asteroid. And that was essentially to make an explosion that would make way, move all the surface rocks out of the way and reveal the rocks underneath the surface, which is the rocks we really want to probe. Because yes, asteroids are all relics of the early solar system, 
But it's really the interior that's the pristine material. The exterior, the surface material has been exposed to the solar wind, to cosmic rays, and will have been affected and like weathered by that. But the interior of the asteroid is still pristine early building blocks of the solar system. So this is a big deal. The samples are expected to arrive back to Earth in December 2020, which is not that far off in comparison to the Dragonfly mission to Titan. So there's lots of intrigue around this mission because Hayabusa 1, which was its predecessor, which returned you know, tiny dust grains from the surface of the asteroid that it went to, revealed that there was a similar ratio of water to rocks as we see on Earth. And so this has put fuel to the theories that the Earth got its water from impacts with asteroids and comets in the very early days of the solar system. So it'd be really interesting to see whether Hayabusa 2 finds the same thing, but in the interior of this asteroid. So the next piece of news is for the subscribers that have been with me since the beginning of this channel. You remember that one of the very first videos I posted was in my Unsolved Mysteries series, and it was about fast radio bursts, these very, very short pulses of radio waves that are coming from somewhere in the universe. And you remember I said that we've seen bursts that repeat a very specific period and have repeated over and over and we can detect them repeating. And then we've detected things that don't repeat at all, that are just one-offs. And there's a couple of different theories to explain how these might come about. We don't really know whether the repeating ones are from the same thing as the non-repeating ones, whether it's the same mechanism. We just don't really know. There's, there's a huge things about fast radio bursts that we don't know. The only ones we've been able to trace to a specific location have been the repeating ones, because if they repeat, you've got a much better chance of spotting which direction they've come from. But now, for the first time, there was a paper published this month from Bannister and collaborators that showed there was a fast radio burst that they detected that didn't repeat, that they managed to figure out where it had come from in the universe. So this was FRB 180924, i.e. it was an FRB detected on the 24th of September 2018, and it lasted for a millisecond. And that millisecond pulse allowed them to figure out that it came from a galaxy four billion light years away. And they were able to do this because it was detected by a radio telescope array called ASCAP in Australia, which is basically 36 antennae. And if you think about this fast radio burst coming in and hitting this array of antennae spread out across the Australian outback, then depending on which direction it comes from, it's gonna hit different antennae at different times. So literally just from a timing consideration, were they able to triangulate its source back to the direction of sky it came from? And they found that it was actually not in the center of the galaxy like a lot of people have been postulating it maybe had something to do with the central supermassive black hole, but it actually came from like the galactic suburbs. So the fact that it's found on the outskirts is really interesting. It's gonna help us whittle down the possible mechanisms that could possibly form these fast radio bursts that we're still not really sure what they are. Are, and helped to determine the difference between the repeating fast radio bursts and the non-repeating fast radio bursts as well. But for me, by far the most interesting paper that came out this month was one by Friedman and collaborators. And what they were trying to do was measure the Hubble constant in a completely independent way than had been done before. So the Hubble constant is essentially a measure of the rate at which the universe is expanding. You essentially look at a galaxy, figure out how fast it's moving away from you from its redshift. Then you look at something like a supernova in that galaxy and from how bright it appears, you know its distance. So then you've got how fast something is moving away from you at a certain distance. And you do that for lots and lots and lots of galaxies and you have the speed they're moving away from you is correlated with their distance. The further away things are, the faster they're moving away from you. And that's how we know the universe is expanding. The Hubble's constant is essentially then the slope of that correlation, and it's measured in kilometers per second per megaparsec, a megaparsec also being a measure of distance that you can put into kilometers. If you do that, you can then work out what the Hubble constant is in per second, so that if you invert that, you get how old the universe is in seconds. Now, some of you might remember this from a video that I did for 60 Symbols with Brady Horan and Ed Copeland a year or so ago, and we figured out the Big Bang happened on a Tuesday. <laughs> if you haven't seen that one, I'll link it for you 
above. Now there's lots of different ways that we can measure the Hubble constant, some of which are dependent on each other and some of which are completely independent. But the thing is they all give you different results, which means they all give you different values for the age of the universe as well. So for example, using Hubble's original method of using supernova in galaxies to measure the distance to them, you find that on the most current experiment, they get a Hubble constant of 74.03 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which gives you an age of the universe of about 13.2 gig years. The other big experiment that's measuring this is the Planck experiment, which is measuring the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. Now you can fit what's called a cosmology to that, uh, basically a description of the universe, our best model of the universe, and from that you get an age out. So it's not a direct measure, but it's still a measure of the age of the universe. And they find that the Hubble constant is 67.4 kilometers per second of a megaparsec, which gives you 14.5 giga years. There's another couple of ways as well. There's something called baryonic acoustic oscillations, which puts you in the 67.77 camp, again, an age of about 14.4 gig years. That's using something on really large scales across the whole universe. You can also do it with gravitational wave mergers as well. We detected an optical counterpart to a neutron star neutron star merger, which allowed us to get a value for the Hubble constant, which was 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which gives you an age of 13.9 billion years. Now you can see that things that you measure locally seem to give you a younger age for the universe and things that you measure that are very like global, i.e. across the entire universe, they give you a much larger age for the universe. And people have been trying to figure out what could be causing such a discrepancy in the different measurements. And for a while it was thought it was the biases and systematics on each measurement. Perhaps our instruments that were measuring this weren't very good, but people have shown that actually we've been able to really drill down the errors to like less than a percent now. And so we're pretty sure that we're getting the right answers, even though the answers then don't match up. Some people had also said that it could be the fact that the Milky Way is found in a void as well. It was called a super void. So a particularly empty part of the universe. And that could be why we're measuring a different value locally. But people have sort of tried to figure out what effect that would have. And it's not a big enough effect to account for basically the 1.4 gear difference that people find for the age of the universe. People have also suggested that the supernova method could be affected by very small lensing between us and the supernova. So for example, if a, a small black hole passes in front of our line of sight to the supernova, it could briefly brighten that supernova. So it would appear artificially brighter than it actually is. But again, people have shown that that increases the scatter around that relation, but it doesn't actually account for the massive differences that you see. The other alternative is that we've got something wrong in our best model of the universe, which is not unlikely. We kind of can't be that arrogant to say that we must be right. But the thing is, if we start tweaking with that, then everything kind of breaks. So this paper that came out from Friedman this month where they were measuring the Hubble constant using a totally independent way of doing it. Instead of using supernova, they were gonna use red giant stars to probe this. So red giant stars are a very specific type of star. We understand them quite well and how they behave and what their brightness is compared to their temperature and their age. And so we can use them as one of these standard candles to know how distant things are. It's both an independent measure of it, but it's also another local measurement of it. And so people were really intrigued when this paper came out to see which camp it would fall into, the 14 and a half giga years or so, or the sort of 13.2 giga years or so camp for the age of the universe. And annoyingly, it fell right in the middle of the two camps, just like the gravitational wave measurement did uh, last year as well. And they came up with a Hubble constant that was 69.8 kilometers per second for megaparsecs, which gives you a age of the universe of 14 billion years. So this is a really contentious area of cosmology and astrophysics right now. Not knowing the age of the universe, perhaps it's that our 
model of the universe, our lambda CDM, our lambda expansion of the universe and cold dark matter model is wrong or maybe just needs some tweaks, or perhaps the way we've been measuring the age of the universe for centuries has something wrong with it or has some bias or something we're not thinking of, or perhaps it is because we're in one of these massive super voids and we don't really understand the difference between a super void and a more clustered or normal area of the universe properly because the super void is all that we know. So it's going to take more study, more measurements, hopefully more independent measurements of this value as well, and perhaps some breakthroughs to determine what actually is the age of the universe. But for now, if anyone asks, it's about 14 billion years. Tracks or channels where it looked like once liquid had flown, flown? Liquid flows? Liquid have flowed, flowed to this array of antennae since its first light back in September, October or so, 2019, 2018, 2018, it's 2018 now, Becky. Now it's, no, it's not 2018, it's 2019 now. It was 2018. Ugh. 